Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Spanning the Need. Tonight, we have a very special guest. New to our area, well, I should say new to the area, but he pretty much knows the region. From the Diocese of Youngstown, Bishop David Bonner. How are you, Bishop? I'm doing great, Anthony. Thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's glad to have you. I, I know you were just installed in January as the new bishop in the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Uh, and I and I think people have just been watching a lot on TV about where you kind of came from and where you have been in the Pittsburgh area and then kind of in this region. But you pretty much are really familiar with this area because you're from the Pittsburgh area. Yes, and, and I'm really familiar with it from the standpoint that my first parochial assignment was at St. Vitus Parish in Newcastle, just over the border, about 25 minutes away, and had the chance to visit Newcastle a week or so ago and just relive some old memories, visit some old friends. And uh, I got to know Youngstown, a little bit of Youngstown in those first four years, uh, just by coming over to Boardman and shopping and eating. And um, so it's it's a great place. I'm so happy to be here. And we're happy to have you. Um, so if people don't um, know your background, tell people a little bit about yourself, where you came from, and, and kind of how you got where you are now. Sure. So I was uh, born in 1962 uh, to George and Mary Bernadette Bonner. I'm the fourth of five children. My dad was a butcher. He also sold real estate um, in addition to being a butcher. At one time, he had three jobs so that we could have food on our table. Uh, my mom was a housewife. Uh, they're both deceased. I have um, uh, two brothers and two sisters. My older, uh, my oldest sister um, is lives in the South Hills of Pittsburgh and is married with two children, two grown children, and um, she is an office manager. Uh, my uh, brother, who's next in the line of age, George, is an engineer. He lives in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. My sister Kathy, she lives in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. She is a a typesetter, and she has uh, she's married with two grown children and. My brother George is married with um, three grown children. And then there's my brother Harry, who lives in um, the uh, North Huntington, Irwin area, about an hour outside of Pittsburgh, east of Pittsburgh. He is a carpenter, and he and his wife have one daughter. She just turned 16. And that's in, and it's funny because you come from your four or five kids. I can only imagine what that household with the or as they call the organized chaos theory well my mom ran a tight ship we had uh, only three bedrooms uh we had a fenced in backyard and that was our world we kind of lived um uh, in that bubble and we lived in a wonderful neighborhood where we had block parties and almost everyone on the street belonged to the parish so um and we were so close that we would call our neighbors uh it wasn't you know, Mr. or Mrs., but it was aunt and uncle. So um, just come from, from very close-knit roots. And of course, um, we are passionate about our sports teams um, in Pittsburgh. Uh, I don't live there anymore, but, um, you know, I still get um, a little fired up, you know, for Pittsburgh sports teams. So if people don't know, you were the chaplain for the Pittsburgh Steelers for almost over a decade. So as a Cleveland Browns fan, which I was going to try and wear a Cleveland Browns shirt, just uh, I won't hold that against you, my eminency. <laughs> so, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to keep it open around here. This is Browns Steelers territory. Well, um, you're right. I was a chaplain for the Steelers. It was a wonderful experience that I had. Um, but, you know, my, my Episcopal motto is that all may be one. Um, and so regardless of what um, jersey we wear, uh, what town we come from, we're all called to be one. And my brother-in-law happens to be a diehard Cleveland Brown fan, and uh, we golf together. We get along real well. So um uh, to anyone who is a Cleveland Brown fan or a San Francisco 49er fan or any other fan other than a Pittsburgh Steeler fan, uh, just know that we love you. And um, of course, we're praying for your conversion too. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine, but I will say this for the record and I will end on this note. We beat you twice in a row. 
Well, for the first know, time in, I think, like 55, 60 years. Sure. It all evens out and it's all fun and games, really. I mean, uh, you know, actually being so close to it, 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 it gave me a whole different perspective. Uh, I used to eat, sleep and drink the Steelers. I couldn't wait till the newspaper was delivered to to just dig into the statistics and the stories uh, of the players and the games, but um, and I still am an avid uh, sports fan on many levels, um, but I'm not as as rabid as I was. I'm not as um, I'm not even a season ticket holder uh, anymore. I just um, you know you you learn there's more to life, and and uh, I mean sports are great. They got us. They're getting us through the pandemic. It's nice that we have somewhere else to put our focus and attention to release our. Our, our energy, but uh, and to bring people together as much as anyone can come together in this time of pandemic. But nonetheless, um, you know, there's there's sports and then there's there's life. And, and you know, I think it's it's a perspective that we, we can't lose sight of. And, and we, we talk a little bit about you were assigned in Newcastle at a parish. Talk about your background, kind of like where you have been in regards to parishes and, and what you kind of look for when you go to these different settings? Sure. So uh, as a priest, I've been ordained 32 years. And in those 32 years, I've been so blessed to live out my dream, which is and always was to be a parish priest, uh, to be a pastor. I, I think that is one of the best positions in, in the church. It's one that um, I thoroughly enjoyed. I got, I was a pastor um, at St. Bartholomew's Parish in Penn Hills for five years. And for 12 years, I was pastor at St. Bernard's Parish in Mount Lebanon. Uh, the last two years or year and a half, there was another parish added to that in which I was also the administrator as the two were, were becoming one. And then just for six months, I was a pastor at St. Aidan Parish, which was a newly foreign parish from two different parishes. So I was so blessed to do that. But I've been blessed to do a lot of other ministry. I was a, uh, a parochial vicar and assistant in three different parishes. I was a part-time chaplain at Pittsburgh's uh, Central Catholic High School. I served as the director of vocations, recruiting men for the priesthood. I was also the director of the permanent diaconate program, um, working with men who were being ordained uh, as per trained and ordained to be permanent deacons. I was also the rector of the seminary, uh, and I, I got to um, live with men on the road to the priesthood. Um, those were exciting positions, very different from uh, being in a, in a parish. And I also was vicar of clergy. I, uh, for two years, I was vicar of clergy. I worked uh, with just exclusively the priests, supporting them, encouraging them. Um, and um, I was also the secretary for parish life and ministerial leadership. So I um, kind of was a troubleshooter and dealt with any issues or problems that emerged in parish life. Um, one of the things that I've been blessed to do for the last four years is that I, um, by God's providence, I have been the editor of The Priest Magazine, which is published by Our Sunday Visitor in Huntington, Indiana. It's a monthly publication for priests. And uh, I'm the, um, the, the content editor, so I generate all the content for uh, the, the monthly issues. And so that means, you know, um, I just go to the computer and I reach out to brother priests from all across the country and even beyond to, um, to help us realize our mission, which is to serve the church and in particular to serve priests. Well, I think it, one question that I always ask, and, and I've talked to several pastors and, and priests over the years is what be, what made you become a priest or and a pastor because i think some people it uh it, it's like how how does that transition happen in regards to you know what i feel that i want to serve so how does how does that work well that was it that's an excellent question and you know one that um i'm often asked and i can tell you that there was no lightning bolt there was no strike of thunder but I just knew from a very young age, I, I kept getting this persistent gnawing whisper to um, to follow to come follow Jesus in the priesthood. And you know, I remember uh, as a, a little boy playing priest, pretending you know I was celebrating mass. Um, my little brother Harry was the altar server. I used to wear tiles tiles as vestments. I used to use. Um, um, ginger ale or, or cherry pop and necro wafers 
um, you know, and and I I just was drawn to the mystery, um, the excitement of of priesthood, um, and it never waned. Um, and even as I you know went to high school and dated, um, uh, and you know developed so many good friendships with with girls. Um, you know, it just kept coming back to me. You know, I, I worked in, when I was in college, I lived at home. I commuted to Duquesne University, pursued a degree in social communications. Uh, I worked for a time in, uh, part-time in a health food store and just loved interfacing with people, helping them. And again, it just kept, it just kept coming at me, you know, real, real strong. Um, and so my senior year at, uh, of college, I entered the seminary, uh, and, um, I was there for one year, finished up at Duquesne, and then I went on to study at the North American, to live at the North American College in Rome and study at the Pontifical Gregorian University, where I was for, for four years. So um, it's just God's grace. And, and through the reflection of so many people that affirmed that grace, and it just came from a wonderful family. I couldn't have had better parents um, and better brothers and sisters. So I feel very, very blessed. And it's funny because I, I there's a, always a joke that, like, I love... Italy. I'm Italian. My my dad is off the boat. My mom's fa family's off the boat, and and we went. I I've never been to Italy, but I went to Italy on my honeymoon. Venice. We were only there for four or five days, but just the the culture, the like, just Italy fascinates me, just as a person. So to live there, how was it to live in Rome and in that region of, of Italy over a, a certain amount of time? Well, it was um, it was bittersweet. Uh, it was bitter because um, I remember leaving, meeting all of my um, classmates in New York, and we flew on um, uh, a TWA jet um, all the way across the pond and landed in uh, Rome, and were immediately taken to St. Peter's. Uh, and of course, we were bleary eyed because we flew all night long, and when you arrive, it's morning, and yet the worst thing you can do is go to sleep. Um, so, I mean, it was very, very um, exciting, but. From the moment you take off, it, it was it was kind of bitter because um, the way it was then, you couldn't come home for two years. So you knew that there was going to be homesickness. And believe me, as one who uh, you know is very comes from a very close knit family who was very much um, rooted with the with the Pittsburgh sports traditions, uh, that was a that was a leap of faith for me. And um, there were many homesick moments. Um, but it was very sweet though too, because it was so new, it was exciting, it was different. I remember um, being told by one priest, um, you know, when you go to Rome, it's gonna be different. That isn't anything good or bad, it's just different. And when we enter into that which is different, it's, it's then that we grow and change and develop. But it was exciting because, you know, the Italians, um, and I know people think I'm Italian, I'm actually Irish, Scotch, and Welsh, but I believe that by my four years of living in that culture just by virtue of immersion um i'm italian we'll claim you we'll claim <laughs> you my dad's dole we'll claim you that'd be great um but you know the italians they know how to live they know how to eat they know how to sleep they know how to a drink i never saw an, a, an inebriated italian and they know how to love they don't have any inhibitions i mean they're they're very uh family conscious and family rooted um and and they're um, and the one thing that was very very hard is th they're very um, just laid back uh, in terms of you know the the intensity that we live with here in America you know the the schedules and the grind and the the lines and the or organization that doesn't really exist at least it didn't exist over thirty years ago in Rome it's just very it's a it's a slower lifestyle um, you know more laid back I mean in, in my day they would close everything down and take a, a reposo, a, a rest, and then they would open things back up. I, I think now um, it's very limited when that when that happens, but um, they really know it's a, it's a very uh, healthy lifestyle, I think, you know, and, and uh, I, I know my parents, I was blessed to have them come to Rome twice, and my mom was scared to death of flying, but, you know, she missed me so much, she got on the plane twice to come over. Um, they got to meet, uh, the Holy Father, uh, Pope Pope Saint John Paul, uh, very very exciting for them. But you know, when they after they left Rome, and and when I came home uh, from my studies, you never eat the same again because every meal is just 
meant to be uh, an experience, an encounter with family, pasta. not just with food. Yeah, pasta. But it just is, you know, you, you don't eat and run. You you savor and you share and you spend time. And, um, and you know, you the table, you set it nice, you know, with fine linens and um, and so it's it really left an imprint on their hearts. I know they they really enjoyed that that experience of dining in Italy. Well, I we experienced it, and and like you talked about the pasta and wine, and, and bread, and bread, and the bread, pasta. yeah, and bread. And and if you ever talk to my wife, which I know you'll probably in the past is she knows she'll tell you I love pasta, and I'd have pasta five times a week. And that's pretty much probably what you had in Italy when you were there. <laughs> Yeah, you could eat pasta. There's so many different ways to make pasta, and you could eat pasta every single day. And of course, in Italy, it's the custom to have the bigger meal at lunchtime. They call it pranzo, usually around 1.15. Um, you know, you have your primo piatto, which is your first plate, which is usually pasta or, or rice or uh, soup. And then you have your secundo piatto, which is usually a meat of some kind. And then there's sometimes, um, you know, salad or um, in a pasto, what have you. And then, you know, one of the big things in Italy is of course, dolce, you know, uh, the, the sweets. So oh, I wasn't, I have a huge sweet tooth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you're making me hungry with desserts. Cause I found a, we were in Venice or Rome and I found a candy store and I just, my wife just let me go. So just one of those fun things when we were in Rome. It, let's talk about the Mahoning Valley. Now you're now installed as, as the, as the next Bishop. What do you see as some of the challenges in our region or the valley? Because I know you cover, if people don't realize, the Diocese of Youngstown covers about six or seven counties, almost halfway up to Cleveland and halfway to Akron. Right. So what are what do you see that some of the challenges that you face region-wise uh, in Ohio? Well, in some ways, Ohio um, is not all that different from Pennsylvania, from where I came from. I mean, the, the, um, in Pittsburgh, there were the steel mills, and uh, they really no longer exist. Uh, they're few and far between. And so Pittsburgh had to redefine itself. And um, here, you know, that industry was such a big thing. And we know that there's been a lot of depression and, and, and loss. Um, you know, that you just drive by that Lordstown plant and you, you get a sense for just how important industry uh, has been to this region. Uh, that's just, it's like a city in and of itself, but it's, it's not what it was. Um, and God only knows if it'll ever be what it was. I mean, uh, life is full of changes. And so I think one of the biggest challenges is um, trying to um, live in this, uh, in this transitional time and, and to um, help people uh, find, um, find jobs um, and, and support uh, as they, they forge ahead. I mean, this, this area was, was, heavily, was heavily hit, um, but I think the greatest strength of this area are the people. I, I've met so many wonderful, kind, loving, gifted individuals. And, um, you know, I think there's great possibilities here and, and potential. I've had the, the opportunity to meet with the mayor. I've met with the president of Youngstown State University. There, there are some, um, I, I think that, you know, and, and I've met with other people and I, I just think there's great possibilities here. I think one of the, the other challenges is just in every, every city, every town is facing this is, where do we go from here relative to the pandemic? How do we come out of this darkness? And so, you know, for that reason, I, I penned a, a pastoral letter, testified to the light that we need to really focus on the light and go back to the basics of our sacramental life and um, root what we are and what we do in prayer um, and, um, and really, um, you know, just be focused on, on our Lord. So, you know, I think that's, you know, another challenge, um, you, you know, in, in that regard. But I think there's, in every challenge, there's opportunities. And I'm an optimist and, uh, I'm excited. I, I'm I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be the bishop. Uh, I look forward to collaborating with the community leaders, with um, our our priests, our parish leaders, uh, just all for the the good of the community and the good of the church. 
And we and let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. As we're almost uh, a little over a year into this pandemic, what have you seen differently in people from when we started to where we are now? Do you see any change from anyone being better, bettering themselves, giving more to the community? Because that's what I've seen. I've seen people kind of stepping up that normally would have not stepped up to help people food security in some. So what have you seen kind of in your, your Western Pennsylvania uh, Mahoning Valley? Well, I think that the pandemic has brought out the best and the worst in all of us. I think we've all had those, those tough days, but we've also had those grace filled days where uh, maybe we saw things more gratefully, more clearly that, prior to this experience of darkness, we just took for granted or didn't see. Um, there's definitely a lot of goodness that has flowed from this, this moment. Um, I think what I'm seeing now is a lot more hope. There's so many more reasons to hope uh, and to, to plan and to be excited about the future. Uh, as vaccines are more and more available, I think that um, we're seeing more and more people uh, as as things un, unfold. So um, I, I think there's so many good stories of of you know what has happened. I think I think one of the the neat things is that it's really um, forced families to be together and to stay together. You know, there was a time when uh, we were all kind of locked down and um, all we had was our family. And I, so I think one of the, graces, one of the silver linings, if you will, is uh, to this whole experience is that we have been able to behold what is unquestionably one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us, our family. Well, and I think that's a great point because we talk about how you talked a little bit earlier about how Italy's pace was a lot slower than United States, Mahoning Valley or North, I'd say North, North and and south are too different in the americas about pace and this may have helped kind of bring a slower down pace but to show hey there's more than just working that matters absolutely i think that um you know I, i'm an avid um outdoors person i i love to golf i love to bike i used to run but you know, at 59, um, it's, you know, I, it's a marathon and, and I don't want to wear out my back or my knees. So I, I walk a lot. And, um, you know, I walked a lot uh, in, in the last six months when I was in, in my new assignment in the North Hills of Pittsburgh in, in what is um, North Park. Uh, there's a big lake and it's five miles around it. And I would go there every day and walk around the lake. Well, here um, I go to Mill Creek Park uh, when I can and walk. And that's the most beautiful park I've ever been in in my in my life but I'm seeing more and more people walking I'm seeing more and more people um, you know outdoors and I think that the, just uh, the, the importance of leading a balanced life of of exercising of taking care of one's health uh, is just so critical uh, in this time yeah and, and I know Mill Creek people don't realize like when you're in it how big Mill Creek Park is I mean it goes on for miles Yes, I, I have not seen uh, all of it. I know there's um, a golf course there that I can't wait to see. I know there's also a, a, a bike path that goes out into Canfield. Um, I've been on those little trails, uh, those, those little bike hike trails um, closer to Youngstown, but I've not been able to venture out yet to as far as you know Boardman or, or Canfield um, on that trail. And I, I look forward to doing that. There's actually, I think, a trail that goes all the way to Lake Erie, or it's either it's either finished, it's it's part of the Lake Mill Creek Park, but then I think it goes all the way up to Lake Erie. So I think either it's done or it's going to be done that you'd be able to ride your bike all the way up to Lake Erie. I look forward to it. And let's talk. So let's let's talk future for the for the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. What are some of your thoughts in in kind of plans or what you're looking at for the future of the diocese? Because there, there's been a lot of different things up in the air uh, over the last decade too. You talked about population, you talked about um, the industry. I mean, at one time, Youngst the city of Youngstown was at 165,000 people. Now they're at 65,000. So just as an example. 
Sure. So I um, I penned a pastoral letter, which is kind of a tool that a bishop has to um, to orient uh, people or to give a direction on a particular issue or, or item. And um, in this case, it was to just kind of take us from the pandemic to a new day that's dawning. And there were some there's some very specific things in there uh, in terms of just, you know, inviting people to come back to prayer if they're hurt in any way to to seek healing. Um, to uh, as a diocese, we certainly want to be more intentional with our communication efforts. Uh, to that end, we are going to be. We just posted a position for a, com a director of communications. Um, we also want to be a service-oriented church and work with our Catholic charities, um, along with our parishes, to assess needs and make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. Um, and then we want to we want to be a church that w joyfully witnesses to the light. Uh, and so, you know, we want to do what we can to grow the church. And one, you know, a lot of times people look at programs or or moments. I, you know, I think growth happens from within. And I think um, when we are more comfortable speaking about our faith and sharing our faith with each other, um, and we're and I'm inviting people to do that in staff meetings, in in prayer gatherings, in small groups, it's much easier to go out into the world and boldly speak to the faith to others. Um, and one by one, two by two, we can make a difference. But it's it's going to take a, a wholehearted commitment, and it's going to take time. Uh, the other thing that that's going on is, you know, we're putting our advisory committees into place. Uh, we're in the process of um, reinstituting the pri the priest council, uh, which is an advisory body that, that the bishop has at his disposal, as well as the diocesan pastoral council, which is comprised of lay men and women who help the bishop with um, various, um, giving input on various matters. We recently uh, hired a social media minister because you know the new front door of the church is social, the social media world. And so we have someone that, that just is gonna be here every day, totally devoted and dedicated to that. And to that end, I've done a whole bunch of videos that appear in our, on our platforms um, to engage our people so, I, but I look forward to working with these councils um, as we as we plan for the future. And I think the most important thing for me is to come to know our our priests and our staff and our parishes, but also to step back and listen to what they're saying. Um, you know, I don't come in with a magical plan. I mean, this is all a matter of God's grace and of a lot of give and take and collaboration. Um, I mean, I, I I have a vision, but I you know. We all need to be part of the mission, and um, I, and I certainly want to do everything that I can to uh, meet people where they're at and call them to where God wants them to be. And I think that that shows kind of your. Unfortunately, we're kind of we were kind of put it up in a pickle because of when we went from the pandemic or from normal life, as they call it now, <laughs> to the pandemic. We looked at technology changing the way we do stuff because no one could go to church. No one could pray. No one could do, like you said, get together. So a lot of parishes went to Facebook and YouTube. So that has helped. I know I've watched it on, on TV and, and on Facebook. So I think what they're doing and what you guys are looking at doing is great. Well, it, but it, you know, it, it's temporary. I mean, we cannot right. take the mass experience and make that a permanent experience virtually, because you know Mass is meant to be celebrated with the community uh, and to receive the Eucharist. So, um, you know, I, I know that people are comfortable in their homes on their lazy boys and their couches, uh, watching virtual TV, uh, virtual masses. But um, I can't wait till everybody comes back home to to church. There's nothing like being there. I, I agree, and and I know we're me and my wife and I are looking forward to go back to church uh, in, in the coming months, kind of hopefully when everything kind of subsides and, and we hopefully will get back to normal in some shape or form. Um, Bishop, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know uh, you got a lot going on. Uh, so I thank you for taking time. You're most welcome, Anthony. God bless you and God bless all your viewers. Thank you. And now at the end of each of each of my show, I like to add ask some fun questions if you're interested. Okay. Fire so any, any answer, personal or professional, there's no right or wrong answer. Which, as a, what is your best accomplishment? 
Um, I don't know if it's happened yet. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, uh, I've had a lot of accomplishments, but um, uh, I'm proud of being a priest. I'm proud of being the editor of the Priest Magazine. Uh, I'm proud of being a pastor, but um, I don't like to rest on laurels. I mean, I think there's always more to, to do, more to be expected. And um, so I don't think I've reached the top of the mountain yet. Okay. Okay. What's your best memory? My best memory is family life growing up in our home and, uh, you know, being with mom and dad and my, my siblings. We also had a cottage at Connie Out Lake. Uh, in, I remember in those days. County, uh, for many years. And we would spend a lot of the summers there. And, you know, I mean, to be a kid and to be living in an amusement park, to, to be right there near the water and, and where you could fish and swim, uh, ride your bike. Um, I mean, it was just, uh, they used to call it Pennsylvania's perfect playground. It was next to our backyard. It was a perfect playground. Yeah, we used to, when I was younger in my teens and in and, and my single digits years and years ago, <laughs> uh, we we would get cottages, go to milk or go to Conneaut State Park and go to the, go on the blue streak as they, they yeah. had it. So I guess they're trying to bring that back now. So best experience. My best experience has been being a priest. I love being a priest. And uh, where whatever the assignment has been, wherever I've been, um, you know, and, and this has been an incredible experience. I mean, it's not an easy experience, but it's just been an incredible. And to be, um, you know, to be chosen by the Holy Father, uh, it's so humbling. I, I, you know, I when I gathered my siblings together to tell them, that I that this was happening that the night before uh, it was announced, I called my sister that day and I said, "I want you to arrange a sibling-only meeting at Mummy and Daddy's grave." And so we met late that afternoon at my parents' grave. We said a prayer, and then I said, "Look, you know, I'm really sorry that I interrupted your day, but I I need to let you know that I'm being transferred." And then I paused and I said, "By the Holy Father," um, because you know all the other transfers came from a bishop. The, the, the local bishop, but this one was by the Holy Father. And that for me is just so, so humbling. And, and for the record, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Holy Father appoints all bishops in the world. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And okay. I have in my office a papal bull with, with his signature on it. It's framed. And, um, and it was read on the day of my ordination by the apostolic nuncio. Okay, that's that's a, that's an honor there. Who's your role model? I would say my dad. Um, you know, my dad was my best friend. My dad's deceased. He died in two thousand and two. Um, but my dad was a hard worker. He had a uh, he was a butcher. You know, he worked in the in the cold, and you know there was um, that was a it was not always easy. Um, but um, you know, at times he he had uh, multiple jobs. Um, and he was a provider. I mean, he, he provided for my mom and for my brothers and sisters and I, and, you know, as a, as a priest, I think that's my calling to provide for God's people, uh, with the sacraments, with the word to be a provider. Okay. Okay. So this one, this one, I like to, I always love to ask because I think it opens up people's minds in, in, in a general sense. So if you could choose one person you would want to meet, past or present, who would it be and why? Well, I would say um, Chuck Knoll, um, the former coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He, he is deceased, but, um, you know, Chuck was a, you know, a no-nonsense guy. He, um, he started from scratch and he, you know, formed a dynasty, um, certainly with the help of those around him too. But, but he had a motto that said, he would often say, whatever it takes, you know, whatever it takes. And um, that has always inspired me, you know, wherever you are, whatever it takes. Um, and, um, and, you know, the thing about Chuck, he didn't worry about what people thought about him. I mean, I think sometimes we can, you know, get so paralyzed by, you know, we can't make this decision because this person will think this or that person will think that. And, you know, we, we have to be single-minded in our focus and, and rise above all that stuff and, and just 
wake up every day and do what's right. And I think that Chuck Knoll did that. Um, and so, you know, that's probably who I would, um, who I would reach out to. Okay. Bishop, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time and your candor. And I appreciate it. This was a great conversation and I hope our viewers enjoy uh, you for the Valley. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us on this special episode with the Bishop of Youngstown, Diocese of Youngstown. If you want more interviews, podcasts, or announcements, please go to anthonyvspano.com. Stay safe, God bless, and have a great night, everyone. Good night.